Michael Collier. Yes. <laughs> you know, Michael, you've already been mentioned on one of the podcasts. What was I? Yeah, oh. you are. I'm going to yeah. talk to you about that, actually. <laughs> it was in a good way. Oh, I'm sure. In I, fact, actually, I'll I talk to you about it right now. Okay. So I had Julie Saucy on. Oh, yeah. right. And, and she said in there, yeah, she had applied for a job at one point in time, long back. Do you remember? Wow, that had to be a long time ago. Yeah. I, yeah. And she told, and she said, yep. Yeah, I couldn't get. I didn't get the job. He didn't think I could do the job. Oh, as a that's friend. not that true. <laughs> I think we were already packed full of uh, employees at the time already. Well, there's your excuse, Julie. He was yeah. packed. It wasn't you. It was just that he was yeah. packed. Oh, <laughs> well, because she's lovely. I mean, she's just a wonderful person. Yeah, that's so, good. So, yeah, yeah, you definitely want to suck up to her now. No, no, yeah. Well, <laughs> but she was lovely then, and yeah. she always has been. Yeah, she was very interesting. Yeah, we talked about uh, yeah. all the things that she had done. And that's the interesting thing about you, really, is that you've intersected with a lot of people that um, come in my life. Uh, including me. I mean, you do the framing for me on uh, Maynard Dixon's. You've done Ed Mel's framing forever. And I thought, you know, how interesting would it be to just put that puzzle together and have you just happen to be here today? And I want to kind of find out more about you because I don't know all the backstory. And I figure you could probably tell me. So where are you from? Where did you grow up? Uh, I was born and raised in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Mm. And uh, kind of stayed there and grew up until I was about 17. Mm -hmm. Graduated high school and my father was retired Navy. No, oh, really? What, he, was he an officer? Or uh, what did he chief do? Petty Officer. Yeah. Uh, and uh, mostly had been on ships uh, and in the early part of the, or at the end of the Second World War. Uh, yeah. But uh, then pretty much after that, he was uh, kind of land, uh, you know, locked in and uh, right. stuff. And uh, But he retired after 20 years. And then he was able to kind of look for work uh, in civil service, and he really found some wonderful opportunities to go overseas uh, mm -hmm. in the South Pacific. Mm -hmm. And uh, right after high school, I ended up living in Guam, going to the University of of Guam, and wow. was there for two years studying in art. I almost got, I almost had to go to Guam. Did you? Really? Yeah, no. I, I, my second year in the, as a, I was a naval doctor for, oh, I was okay. with the Marine Corps for four years, but they said, oh. oh, you're going to Guam. And I said, okay. And I said, I, I, sir. But then at the last minute, they go, no, we got somebody else. You can stay here in the States. I said, okay. So how was Guam? I missed Guam it. Guam was actually fabulous. Yeah, I kind of wanted island. to go. I kind of felt I mean, bad I never got to go. 1967, uh, I was there through 1969. And you were 18 at that time? 18, right. Yeah. And, of course, the Vietnam War was going on, so uh, they had a Air Force base there on the north end of the island, and they were doing – Two bombing runs a day. Oh my God! To Vietnam. Yeah. So it was a hectic area, uh, stuff, and there was a lot of medical hospitals there for uh, wounded soldiers from from Vietnam yeah, sure, coming to a place called Asan. Yeah. And that's where a lot of them were staying at. Right. And stuff. So, but it was a big ship repair facility, and uh, obviously, I think at some point nuclear subs. And what year was this? This was 1967 through 69. Yeah, so you went right through the Tet Offensive in 68. Yeah, I, yeah. I guess so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And stuff. Uh, I probably was more of a student, wasn't quite aware of it. Yeah. Uh, at that time, I wasn't probably paying that much attention. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of such a, an experience to be living yeah, in that part of the world and uh, being in Guam. And it was a great experience. And uh, I had great teachers, uh, Terry Taggart, who was from the, uh, uh, Oklahoma, uh -huh. who came out to teach. And uh, he was my mentor at that time. And this was in art? or Yeah, in art. Yeah. I studied mm -hmm. study painting. I was kind of doing a little bit of everything, but painting. Right. And uh, I was up. And then after two years, uh, uh, my parents thought, well, maybe it's a good chance for you to come back to the States. And I applied at ASU and, and uh, Ohio State. Mm -hmm. Got accepted to both the transfer. Yeah. And um, so I ended up coming to. Arizona came here to ASU. So why? What brought you to ASU? What was uh, well, the actually, draw? Well, it was. I really didn't have so much a a choice so much as the fact that I had relatives and family here, and my parents wanted me to come live with them yes. and go to school, and that's what I ended up doing. And so, did they move to Arizona too? Or I, well, my no, my parents never did. They they kept traveling and living. And yeah. uh, um, after Guam, they actually were living in Thailand for almost eight years. Wow. And stuff. So it became a real experience there for my younger sister, and then they adopted my older sister uh -huh. um, and stuff. And, uh, and she's, she's Taiwanese? Uh, no, she's Thai. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, so she is back stateside now, but she's retired and traveling Europe. She keeps sending me emails saying, 
I'll see you when I see you. That's about it. Yeah. And she uh -huh. says, I'm not coming back if I don't have to. She, yeah. She just she, likes the adventure. Oh, she, she loves the adventure, loves to travel, and, and she's just got it figured out. I'm really jealous of her. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Well, you can do it. All you gotta, yeah, no, that's I true. I don't know if Ed Mel will like, like it if you yeah. quit framing no, for him. No, probably wouldn't. You know, Ed, you know how Ed is. He's... Uh, <laughs> Pretty much set in his way, easygoing guy, but yeah. he likes what he likes. Yeah, you know? no, he, he like he has good taste. He has great taste. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're uh, ASU. You finish, and you do two years at ASU. Yeah, uh, no, I didn't finish up, and yeah, I did my junior year, and I, I just the school just didn't interest me any longer. And, and that was art. You were also doing yeah, art studying then? art there, yeah. and uh, and I just kind of left school and and uh, meandered a little bit, doing photography. And then after, and was that for doing it for yourself yeah, or actually for trying to make a living? No, no, I wasn't making a living. I was just doing it for myself. Um, and actually, I, I bumped into, because of ASU, a, a, a young gentleman named Bob Jacobson. And we, uh, he was a graduate student, and uh, we became friends. And But he was working at a frame shop. Mm -hmm. And I was going in and doing frame-it-yourself kind of uh, things. Right. And, and so, but he one day said, you know, they're looking for someone to come help here. Mm -hmm. He says, you want to see if you can apply for a job here. So I did, got it, and worked there for a number of years. And uh, in a roundabout way, I ended up buying the place. And so you started working for him early, mid-70s? 70s, yeah, mid-70s, 1976. Yeah. And then uh, right about 19... So you were 26 or so yourself? Uh, yeah, 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 and exactly. And uh, uh, after about six years uh, working with him, I ended up, able to acquire and buy the business uh, mm -hmm. the owner wanted to get out mm -hmm. and he just made me a great offer to so in 82 or so yeah you so went in 82 the... and it's right before that i had met ed mel uh-huh and he and was how'd you meet ed actually a, 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 a lady there uh, on main street in scottsdale had a gallery called elizabeth burns mm -hmm. elizabeth burns gallery and she had taken ed on and she sent him down to get a few things framed and the first piece of artwork i saw by ed i realized this guy is really a really good artist, and it, it's not, you know, just a decorative. I mean, right. it's serious art, right. and it's very good. And plus, he was just a really easygoing, nice, unpretentious guy. He just, you know, and and uh, what year was that? That was a, probably about 1980, 81. Yeah, right around. Yeah, then. right around okay. then. Yeah, because his first, I think, real exhibit was in Amarillo around 1980. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. I, though I wasn't real conscious of what he was doing at that point. I'm just, sure. He had been just with Elizabeth Burns, and then he joined uh, a, a Suzanne Brown Gallery, which he ended up being there for 18 years. Yeah. And had a wonderful relationship with her. Yep. And stuff. And then when she closed down, um, oh, he had a brief thing where he was with um, Marilyn Butler. That's right. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. After Elizabeth Burns closed. He was with Marilyn Butler, and then... What year was that? Was God, that, was, that had to be around 83, 84, possibly. Yeah. I'm not uh -huh. sure the dates exactly. But then he had this long run with Suzanne Brown Gallery. Right. And then when that ended, he went over to Overland. Right. Until right. Uh, Ray Johnson decided yep. it was time for him yeah. to get out of the Yeah, place. when Suzanne Brown, when I wanted to start representing Ed like 20 years ago, she had to come down and vet me. Oh, did you? <laughs> oh, wow. I'm not sure exactly what that was all about. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I think maybe make sure I wasn't too much of a competition as yeah, much that as could anything. Well be, but there was room. Yeah, Let's there was room. Of there course. was room in this. Yeah. 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 And it was a, a, the best thing that Ed was able because he'd only been with uh, uh, Ray Dewey at Dewey Galleries. Right. In Santa Fe. Oh, it's Dewey. Yeah. I'm sorry, I should put it that way. And, uh, well, it was Ray Dewey yeah. Gallery at that yeah, time. Yeah, it Ray, was Ray It was Dewey, Owens Dewey. I Owens think. Dewey, then yeah. became Owens Gallery. Right. Which was a wonderful relationship for him to have yeah. all these years. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Now, so you met Ed about 1982. 182. Right. right and, then, and, and you were, so in some, I guess you were actually framing his paintings, even though they wouldn't be considered to be a call your frame they were through well, this right we just started doing a few little minor things and then uh i had left i was still at a place called sunshine frame shop yeah and and that's when i kind of purchased the business right and then i reopened under my own name called call your frames art and what year was that that, that was 82 the, that was, was when and it then became of course it was frame. my real my first real you know serious customer i had, I had people coming in but I, but ed was um you know just uh you know it was this artist that was so know. was that the little just plain uh, pine frames at yeah, that time? Yeah, simple frames. We were doing hardwood frames, real simple. Right. They had like a real minimalist look. Right. And and that's how we started out. And then just uh, and when did you switch over to like the carved and then you put color Probably in them too as well? Around 1984, Four. we started 
had said, hey, you know, I'd like to have a frame of my own, you know. Right, design. A, the, right. a signature look. Right, he's starting to get some yeah. traction at yeah, this point. Yeah, he was. And, and, and uh, we were just still, just, we started out with that, and then we just evolved them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I, I was able to move my location, and then I picked up, you know, my experience in framing was, was you know, expanding all the time. Right. So we really got into really doing finished corner frames, closed corner. And Ed loved all that. And then we started being able to uh, do tinting on the frames and doing, I'll say, trick airbrushing uh -huh. on the finishes. And, and we just did these finishes that were very complementary to the paintings. And how involved was that? Was it a kind of a, a, collab, a collaboration between you and Ed? Yeah, it those? was. It was. You know, Ed you know, would come, come up, you know, you know I, I found some profiles and then he kind of, Manipulated him a little bit, and so and we came up with our own profile. Mm -hmm. Basically, where you know Ed really saying, you know, "Here's what I really want." Right. And then we just started getting them milled and manufactured, and uh, uh, then and then from there we kept doing the finishes. So basically, those. Yeah. So basically, from '82 on, then you've really yeah. From '82 kinda... on, I had a real strong relationship. Uh, I built with Ed, and we got along just great, and we just kept evolving his frames. And so that '84 to to what maybe '88, you were using the kind of a. Uh, a simple frame. Yeah, but it was it had... very simple with a rounded finished corner. Right, and they were painted usually to well, kind of complement yeah, the painting. Polychrome finish painted yeah. uh, using lacquers. And then we, uh, uh, of course, uh, someone mentioned or I said, let's you know, let's see about gilding them. Yeah. And uh, with a, a you know yeah. gold or silver, we went with the metal leaf because it was a more affordable, easy way to start. But you know, we developed the technique and the look, and everybody you know found it very attractive. And when was that? Did you that start was, that was right around eighty, just about eighty five. Yeah, okay. We quickly went into doing that, and and then we just never looked back, and we stopped doing the painted frames. We right. occasionally would repair or do something, but pretty much we went to the gilding of the frames. And, and so, when somebody brings one of those old frames back, the gil the ones that don't have the gilding, do you say? Let's put on a new one, or yeah, they do. Yeah, but they do. what they do you to... say? Do you? Well, we because it's still your frame. Say, it's still I said well, you know it's part of the right. intrinsic you know history right. of the piece and, and valuable. Right. But some people just want to update, so we say okay. Yeah. We rarely see them any uh, coming uh, back to us. Yeah. Uh, it, it's not that often. The occasional painting done by it somehow wasn't framed by me, and it got out there because a client wanted it unframed for whatever the reason, or they wanted to do their own frame, and they right. Weren't realizing the signature look that we right. done, right. And so some of those do come back, and we we we, we redo them. Well, here's or, a here's yeah. a funny one. I just had one, I had your frame. I sold it. I bought the painting back. They reframed it, and then I'm having to get a new frame, yours, yeah. back on it. <laughs> so it's gone. You know, Collier to somebody else, to back to Collier. Yeah, right. And and, and we, we we do the like yourself, and then we get collectors call us and say, you know, hey. Either something the frame was damaged badly, or, or over time it's so beat up, right? You know, and then they just say, you know, let's update the frame, mm -hmm. and uh, um, you know, we don't do too much in shipping with them in terms of people calling us, but th that's r rare. Most times the, the pieces are brought to us. We're lucky enough to get the piece back. It's great to see them, and, and the way we finish the frames, we always try to tone or tint the frames that we feel it fits the painting, right? So that's why we feel like we love that, that when we can really get the painting back. Yeah, and actually see the painting. Actually see it. Yeah. And we, you know, I have two wonderful assistants, uh, Matt Bray and uh, Mike uh, Mulligan. And uh, he, they both have just evolved over the years. And they've got the eye, you know, and uh, they just do a lot of great finishing now for me. Yeah. I and, still get in and do it myself. Yeah. Uh, that's more in the carving, especially on the Dixon frames. Right, right. But, uh, Which you just did for me today. Right, Three exactly. Three paintings yeah. that I hadn't had framed in a long right. time. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, it was time to update. But Ed's, Ed's frames really did evolve. And uh, you and know, still, to some extent, are kind of still evolving when you say a, a little, little bit. A little bit, yeah. We, yeah. You know, we, we've... we've, we've you know, I have not done too much the last few years, but I, I think sometimes he'll, he, he, you know, Ed loves to kind of renovate, especially yeah. in his homes, and yeah. it follows through the framing. He wants to update a little something new. And, right. And, and we've also evolved the frames to suit the size, the panels. That's right. The canvas, you know, so they're, they're proportional. Right. You know, some people like a big frame on them. Some people want a more right. proportional. Yeah, I'm with that group. Yeah, so, the, yeah, and so that works out really quite well. So it gives variety for us and... and so the guys are never bored. I mean, then they just, right. so they, they liked it. But I think we're almost due for a, a new design. Yeah. Oh. I'm hoping. Yeah. I, you know, I wouldn't mind, you know, evolving it a little bit. But 
we've been I don't I say we're not stagnant but just I think it's yeah. time for something a little fresh and uh, well and you know and it's interesting I, I tell people when they buy a, a Mel frame with a, a Mel painting you know if you're going to change it don't get rid of that frame that frame's an important thing you yeah can, it you, is. you can it's, change it but keep the damn frame right I, I guess we hadn't even mentioned that you know Ed even came up with this idea it was wonderful to have a signature frame and literally in the terms of his signature That's we right. put into a die a stamping tool right and we we stamped the side of the frame with his signature so yep. it's a, it truly is a signature frame yeah and everybody looks for that now right too. and they do yeah. yeah and and we've only on a couple occasions forgot to do it right and, uh, but, uh, <laughs> i know so i think we i bite bit, the bullet we've had we, a couple times yeah and, but you know the guys are really good about it and and uh Stuff, well, yeah. people, even artists, you know, it's the first thing I try to do is check the painting because artists forget to paint the painting too. They finish it and they're like, oh, thank God, I'm done. Next. And then they go, oh, forgot to paint it uh, with a signature. So I, I don't know if Ed has ever done that. It just says, in fact, that says something about Ed that he hasn't. I think he's almost always signed every painting. But most of my artists at one point or another have forgotten to sign a painting. Ed's been really good about that. I think the only thing he started doing was really signing the back again yeah putting really the date, date and information and the title yeah. information yeah that's which right. he you know and then actually when they've come back if they haven't been done he'll get a hold of it and yeah fortunate work because we live close yep you know we can do that and he he'll update it right there even yeah so and he's, he's really good about and he's that. meticulous he's a meticulous human being well, right. just you know very similar to maynard dixon who kept a log you know of all the works that he did you know, great dating, great... and, and oh, Really, as, Ed does, yes. Yeah, and as a historian, if you go back to look at it, art historian, you want to be able to... Those are the best when you have those kind of individuals. You can go, okay, I know it's this date, this date, this date. And the framing was one of the reasons I'm just kind of picking up on this framing thing. And for those of you who are Ed Mel fans are going to love it for the other people, stay tuned. We'll, we'll talk about other things. But that framing of when you did things, I think, is important, too. And I've always... I kind of knew the dates, yeah, just, you're really good. You've got, you have got you have a good memory of knowing when they were done. Yeah, and we can look at them and and you know, um, can obviously can date our time there too. I mean, right even to the how we installed them in the back we, over the years, little minor things we you know you note right because you know we're, we're very conscientious of installing, painting the backs, making sure everything's set right, looks right. good. Right, and the back should look as nice, you know, as you know with a nice finished you know look. Yeah, you know, so just like you yeah, know. no, it's a good match. You both are meticulous. Yeah. So. Now, so you, so we, do, so you do this. You start in '82 with uh, your frame shop, but you did a lot of other things too. Um, you've done restaurants, I know that you yeah, we major do, we do restaurants. Interiors. We were doing. We, we got involved in doing a few great restaurants uh, uh, in, in town. Uh, the um, I'm going blank here for a second. One of the uh, steakhouses, right? Yeah, Didn't Rancho you do... Pino. Oh, yeah. Well, an individual uh, like Rancho Pino, uh, Chris Hoffman. Yep. And then uh, Chris Bianco. When he first started, we did a little few things for him. But we got involved with a chain, which was the Black Angus, yeah. Stuart Anderson, right. Black Angus Restaurant. And uh, they were absolutely wonderful to us because they came in and wanted us to be real creative. Right. So we just got to go crazy i remember but, when you were buying stuff for them it was like yeah you know, we're just, looking for the right objects yeah and well that a little bit of that and, and stuff they did have a wonderful um uh photographer they were working with uh, david stecklein who's now deceased sadly but he helped help kind of prod them to look at me and uh, when, when we were really hooked up it was a wonderful relationship and they were very great about just i mean at one point we were kind of being you know not repetitious but a lot of similar frames, and they came back and said, "No, no, no. Be very creative. Make it as original as you want." And, right. And we we just loved it, and uh, uh, we did about six restaurants for a start. Yeah. You and know. are those uh, any of those frames ever come back on the market? Like when a Black Angus closes or revent? Well, whatever. they did, but a lot of them got stored and reused in in. The restaurant, uh, other restaurants uh, that were revamped. Yeah. So they didn't they didn't waste any of it. They really kept. And a lot it's of still it. in business, Black Angus. Yeah, they 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 really uh, went through a um, downsizing, and uh, but they made a nice comeback. Uh, and they uh, uh, really only this past year to, I guess marketing. You know, somebody's gotten with them, and and they've just kind of gotten with this more contemporary 
you know, fashionable look. Yeah. And no longer doing the custom made frames and stuff. It's real serious marketing. Yeah. And campaigns and and uh, more clean, minimal yeah, for the yeah. millennials. And it's, and I'm 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 really sad about that. Uh, uh, but you know they were great to us, and and the restaurants that still do exist, yeah, have a lot of our work in there. Because yeah. so those frames would be valuable, I would think. Yeah, just well, as, they a, are, as a frame. Know, I, I don't know how they see it, but uh, and I don't know the newest owners. Uh, I, I I never have been able to meet them. Yeah, because uh, it was just such a large chain. Yeah, of course, it's a big but, deal. Um, You're a cog. But the ones we did do, and we were just not more than two years ago, we did one in um, over in San Diego mm -hmm. in, in Escondido. And that was the last one we did for them. But they did give us carte blanche again and nice. just told us to, they just said, make, here's make how many pieces you want, and here's the floor plan, make everything you want. And well, we, Mark McDowell kind of did that with Ann Dawes in, oh, really? in, yeah, in Scottsdale. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if you know Mark, obviously, oh, sure. no, of and you of probably course. have had long. Yeah, great artist. Yeah, yeah, he is a wonderful artist, and a guy I'm going to have on the podcast sometime as soon as he gets down to Tucson. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, he did the Andaz, and each I guess there's like 22 Andazes and across the world, and each one has its own unique um, thematic, and and he worked on doing that one, and we just were wow. in the one in Maui. Aware that he had yeah, and so that's something you should go check out. Go talk to Mark. Go see it. Yeah, I'll have to ask him um, about that. I, yeah, yeah, I, I wasn't aware. You know, we all got kind of focused on you know our niche. <laughs> Sometimes we don't get to see each other. And speaking much. of niches, you also have been very involved in uh, Lawn McGargi, right? Right, yeah. And I, How did that all come about? You know, that tell was just people a fascination may, in the early days. Yeah, of, tell people about Lon McGargy because a lot of people may not know who the well, artist he was is. This, you know, young artist who came out uh, at about age uh, sixteen. Yeah, no, no, fourteen actually. I'm sorry. You to Phoenix, younger. right? Yeah, to Phoenix in about uh, it was uh, around 1896, and um, he had a relative or an aunt and um, who had a, a small boarding house. And a, a dairy, a, the Borton Dairy, I think it was, mm -hmm. around 24th Street Indian School in Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. Uh, and he came out and uh, lived with them, and he always had wanted to come west, so he did. And, and where was he from? From Philadelphia. From and Philadelphia. he was born in 1883. Yeah. And uh, I guess he had always had this fascination about being yeah. a cowboy right. and stuff. And so he got this opportunity. He came out, uh, and by the turn of the century, at age 17, he had become a real working cowhand in Arizona. In Arizona, yeah. Before it was even a state, then right. Before it hadn't even been a state yet, which is not till 1912. Yeah. So he was really a full fledged uh, uh, working cowhand, and and a good one, my understanding hmm. was. Um, though I think he attempted in the early part of the uh, 20th century to start up a, a cattle ranch, but he hit it at the worst time when they were having a huge drought mm. here, and they you that's know, the and, cattle business. Yeah, that's the cattle <laughs> business. And uh, but he obviously had some natural talent mm -hmm. at drawing, and it was obviously very obvious. And when he realized he was not going to make it in the cattle business, I guess someone suggested, or, or he realized, he went back to school, went back to uh, to the University of Pennsylvania, mm. did some more schooling there in art, came back out after that to uh, Arizona and California, mm -hmm. uh, studied under a couple of artists, um, and really started his career by at least about around 1910. Now, when he went to the University of Pennsylvania, you don't know if he knew Mary Russell Farrell Colton, do you? Because she was there, too, you know, I believe. I, I, that, Same time, I know. really. Yeah, that's it's a coincidence because it's the time frame would yeah. seem right. Yeah. But you never know people, are, they just don't. Right. They cross paths, but not enough. Yeah, because yeah. she came back out here. She did her honeymoon in 1912 in Flagstaff. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. So okay. they were they were definitely contemporaries and even the same place. So Lon McGargy... He gets his training. He actually gets an art degree. Not that I'm, I'm aware of. No, he didn't get an art degree. But he did he, but, took. But he took the something. schooling and stuff. Uh, um, but he did come back and he did go to California, uh, Los Angeles, studied with. I can't think of the painter's name at the moment, but uh, he really did have really great talent. He had great, great drawing skills, and I think at this time period it was very illustrious. Very people were really academically trained. Right. And of course, I guess the bread and butter was to be an illustrator. As yeah, as it, was the, it was the golden age. Golden age of it, of course, as we know. Yeah. And uh, so he was successful with it and, and did well, though I think he was always coming back to Arizona. I think he was always trying to look for an opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, for something uh, in his art world where he would gain notoriety or just get representation, whatever right. it might be. But he, but he was he was prolific, more than everybody ever realized, uh, you know, until we did the research. And he really did paint and draw very well. And, yeah. Uh, 
So when did he come back to Arizona after California? Did he come and stay? I mean, he obviously at some point. Yeah, he was he always traveling because he, you know, he was going either up to Denver. He was always going over to Santa Fe. Yeah. You know, he was spending time in in New Mexico and of course Colorado and. And then he, he was always figuring out some way to travel. Because mm, I so, think of him as an Arizona artist. Right. And, and you normally, you, you would. And so it wasn't until we started doing the research in later years that all of a sudden, and that was actually uh, through Betsy Fallman, the, the historian over right. at ASU. And she really did great research and found out that he really was traveling much more extensively. Mm. So whenever he was gaining you know financial gain, he was taking that an opportunity to travel. Mm. So he was either going down to Mexico um, you know, are just going to Spain. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, at one point, he by 1931, he was going to Tahiti. Hmm. And he Did he had, do Tahitian paintings? Yeah, there, there was a few, uh, only one that we really have a reference to, and I'd only seen a photograph and of, of a Tahitian woman and, you know, uh, kind of Gogan-esque. Yeah, how long was he with it? Are you, I, I only, I, it must have been for a year or so. Wow, that's a long uh, time. Yeah, and, and, you know, I figured it just would have took to be on a ship to go, you know. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, really. Well, that was right in the heart of the Depression, so there wasn't exactly. a lot going on. So right, you know. Maybe he just figured, I'll go to Tahiti. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's got to be cheaper than here. But, you know, he did go there. He came back, and um, there was, I guess, a body of work. Uh, uh, but we're yeah. only aware of the one I saw, but in a very strange, um, um, serendipitous uh, incident. I got a call one day at the gallery, and uh, about midday, and a gentleman with sort of a French accent saying, you know, I have a piece of work by Lon McGargy. And I said, I'm sitting here looking at it. And uh, uh, he said, I was doing the research. And he said, I never thought this person could be a cowboy and an artist. Right. But in the long and short of it was he, uh, uh, his sister had gotten it in New York mm-hmm. back in 1970, 76. And uh, it was, he inherited the painting. And... Uh, he just said, I'm just trying to find out more about it. And he said, in a thread of searching on the internet, I found you. Yeah, and, and what was the image? It, it, it was the Tahitian it was. girl, and it was the photograph I had from the estate oh, that wow. I had. Oh, how so interesting. It was a wonderful painting. And, yeah. and uh, so but, where did he come after 31? Did he come he back? Come back to, he came back out to Arizona Yeah. after 31 of being in, in New York, of course. And um, uh, I think he just tried, 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 was always, you know, working, you know, the system. You know, and I think he was still going maybe... I don't know the dates he was in Denver. I know he spent time in Santa Fe and painted mm-hmm. for a while. Mm-hmm. And so we know there's bodies of work that stayed there. Mm-hmm. He was doing the printmaking, the woodblock prints. Yeah, where was that being done? Uh, I, I think he came back to finish all that in Phoenix. So he was using the commercial works and then uh, either, we're not really sure exactly, but whether he had done the illustration first and then started doing the woodblocks. But he started doing the woodblocks in the early 20s and probably did those up and through the maybe late 30s. But mm-hmm. in 31, he created a book, and it was a, um, 28 uh, images mm-hmm. and uh, woodblocks, and uh, there were 28 poems uh, written by a gentleman, uh, Roy George, who was the editor of the... Uh, what was it called? The uh, was it the Scottsdale Bulletin done in 1922, and I, we think he actually printed um, with Letterset Press mm-hmm. at at the newspaper to be able to get them printed, and then of course he had the bindings done somewhere. Yeah, how many books were done? Do you know? Well, 500. We we, we and these were each one. Did it have original wood blocks in each in uh, the well, book? The Letterset Press, which is really kind of a block, you know printing style right so but he did those books and he did 500 of them handmade mm. even the cover of the book was a block print hand and handmade paper which i guess he couldn't afford the fabric so he used paper which yeah. was a, a detriment to its survival in later years because that paper became brittle and, the and that's a falling very apart. rare book I it's said. a very rare book he never made he was making those to try to find a publisher to do a real trade copy right and, uh, and, and what uh, would something like that be worth? Do you know these days? Yeah. Uh, I we I would say we're in the, you know, depending on the quality of the book, twenty five hundred to yeah. thirty five hundred now. Wow. Yeah. It, is it, it worth as more as a book or as actually to get the prints out? The it's been really, I think it's really much more worth as the book. Yeah. The book in itself is a piece of artwork. Yeah, of course. You know, and we, I, it took me uh, about ten to fifteen years to find about. 
10 copies. Yeah. And then I took them to a book restore here in, in Phoenix, Arizona, mm-hmm. and they, I had them design and make a um, clamshell case. I had Don Haggerty, the noted yeah. authority on Maynard Dixon, right. who I knew through Ed and right. you guys, right. and he wrote me a small history. So we included this whole oh, process nice. and made this real collectible book. Yeah. And in this clamshell case, included a great photograph of one. Uh, you know, Is that, are those thing. still available? I have a few left, yeah. Yeah, I, cool. yeah, I, I, I'm, um, uh, I still look for them. I've, I've found, I have about four left that we did the, re- the restoration on yeah. and then put them in the cases. We have extra cases. We, when I made them, I, I thought, I better make extra because someone will have a book yeah. and wish they had the case that, right. we, that we got. Hey. Let's uh-huh. do this. Uh-huh. <laughs> so we have still a few of those available. Good. But it, it's it's a fabulous piece of artwork. Yeah. You know, and the block prints were much, the real ones are, uh, the originals are larger. Right. Only one was very similar in size. And one of those sell for, I really don't. The block it. prints, we have yeah. those priced in a range. The real wood blocks, uh, uh, especially the ones that are from the book, we priced at about 25 3500 yeah. And that includes the frames that we made because we did a signature frame. Yeah. And uh, of course, that's all, you know, museum. Yeah. So that's a good frame. portion of the value, too. Is yeah. A bit of that, yeah. too. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and there, it's a wonderful, when you really see a group of them, it yeah. really is impressive. In fact, I, the, the, you know, uh, with old Abe Hayes is, you know, he's a real big fan. And yeah. He's got a traveling exhibition. Yeah, he has every single print. I don't have every single one myself. How many are there? How many prints? There, well, are there? I, you know, there were twenty eight in the book, and there's a few others. So there's a other other ones that did he didn't put in the book, or there's some very slight variations. I think he had a traveling show of so over 30, 34. And those wood blocks are different than the actual ones that are in the book, right? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. they're larger, and they were really, and some of those were done as we call a block print, because some of them are a linoleum cut. Yeah. Some of them are real wood block cut. Right. Except, and we think maybe some might have been uh, a letter set press where you, you he would do the original drawing and then transfer it to a plate. I see. And stuff, and then print those. But that's really a block print. Yeah, in, in yeah, the same way. different types. Yeah, different types. And when so. did he start doing his illustration? Because he did some major magazines too. Oh, he right? was doing illustrations early in 1910. 1910. For Outdoor Life. That's the ones, ones we didn't find those until much later on. So he was really. And at he did it, it his whole life? Uh, no, he or was probably there a stopped. Point? I think there was a stopping point. Uh, you know, he. We know that he did uh, Western Story magazine uh, from the early twenties all the way up through. We know up till about nineteen thirty six, mm. and then after nineteen thirty six, he might have done. We don't know about, but he might have done some other advertising artwork for somebody. And when did he die? Uh, he died in nineteen sixty, in January of nineteen sixty. Wow, 1960. so he lived to be an old guy. Yeah, he was seventy seven. So you know, and uh, was he still making art toward the end? Yes, or really quite up to right to the end. Yeah. And he, he stayed, uh, I would say he was very health conscious. Mm-hmm. He had a real regime. He prided himself on being healthy. Uh, well, and also, uh, as most people you know, know, he was a real ladies' man. Oh, I didn't he, know that. But oh, well. God, he was married <laughs> almost eight times. Oh, yeah. So he was, uh, he was. Uh, yeah, Is that what was, we call it now, ladies' man? Yeah, really? Yeah, <laughs> so I guess maybe another be name for that. Right? Another, <laughs> <jingle over. laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah, uh-huh. but he was, uh, you know, he was handsome. And stuff. And, yeah. uh, and now the Hermosa Inn, right? Right. The Hermosa Inn is now, which was one of the homes he he started out to build, which was a 1934. And this think. is in Phoenix. Yeah, in Phoenix, right? actually, in Paradise Valley. Paradise Valley. Valley. Paradise so this Valley. is a hotel we're talking about, which is a great hotel. No, it's a real I really okay. enjoy yeah, top, staying there. Top a great, gorgeous place. And a great restaurant called Lons, Lons right? Lons, and so exactly. when did he start building that place? About 1934, I think he had it built. Uh, he And he was doing the construction himself. Mm-hmm. He was using indigenous uh, uh, area people there doing uh, adobe right yeah. on the, on on the property, and uh, he had a natural talent for building. I mean, he just yeah. had that natural knack, and he, I'm told, he used to get out there with a string and a line and a stick and whatever. Yeah, and so he, that was his home for how many years? Was quite that? a few years. I, he did sell it uh, sometime in the mid 30s. He only kept it for a number of years and yeah. sold it, and moved on. And uh, but he did build a couple more. Uh, homes in the area, uh, one over on 24th Street, south of Camelback. And there's been thoughts that he might have built another one in Paradise Valley mm. because it has all the elements, they said, that seem And when did it become the Hermosa End, you know? You know, that I can't remember when it, uh, that date, I don't know. But I think even from from the 50s or yeah. it's stuff. Yeah, and I would encourage people who listen to this, if you haven't stated that, because I have, it's a great, it's it a is, great old ranch style. They've renovated it two times. 
hotel, wonderful restaurant, just a, you know, and it's right in the heart of Paradise Valley. Right, and the current owners have done a fabulous job yeah. uh, of, re, you know, restoring it. It's run by some great people there. Yeah, that's and, a wonderful uh, hotel. Yeah, it is. They need to be uh, doing my podcast and, uh, you know, advertising on it there, the Hamosa Inn. I'll give you your first one free. <laughs> so, so you made that... Um, Really, kind of your niche, one of your niche areas. I would. Yeah, really, really say. with Salome, because I just really enjoyed who he was, and and he was such a character here. Mm. I mean, you know, and he had a wonderful kind of a, a, a flamboyant history, you know, that he actually claimed. Though a lot of it, you know, was, right. was you know stretched a bit. Well, he had eight uh, wives. So. <laughs> yeah, well, the eight wives were pretty much true. He probably yeah, but, had, to, but, but, had uh, a hard time keeping things. Separate. Yeah, I guess you know, he just wasn't successful at marriage, so he tried a lot yeah. to make it work. <laughs> but his last marriage was really a solid one. Yeah, uh, Hermione, uh, and uh, you know he, he he was married to her. Uh, they moved to Sedona um, and had a home there. And then of course he had a, a kind of a, a minor ac car accident, uh, and, but he developed pneumonia mm. uh, from being just banged up with the weather and uh, right. stuff. And then he but he died up in that area, Clarksville. Yeah, at uh, 77. So yeah, and that was 70, 19, uh, But he was 1960, 70. I'm sorry. He was yeah. 77. Yeah, he was 77. Yeah. So he really lived yeah. a, a good a good life and and uh, stuff. Um so I, And so do you know if he ever knew Maynard Dixon? That has never been I don't know that answer yeah, actually. No, I, I really I'm clarify sure they whether knew he did. each other, but it, it, they had to know it, of each other. Right. And whether they met in you know, in passing or academy, yeah. you would have thought they would, especially with Phoenix, Tucson, Tim. Yeah, and you also know, I mean, Santa Fe just Santa Fe, different places. Yeah, just because the, they were all in the same circle. And they're both illustrators. But there's nothing written or stated, you know. Yeah, I haven't found from that. From the either. book, there's no indication that he ever met mm -hmm. or, or, or you know, had a chance to be with uh, or know Maynard Dixon, which seems odd. Yeah, because actually, uh, Lon was popular here. Oh, know, I'm sure. And and he, after, you know, after the war, you know, with everybody migrating and coming out of the west and, and moving here, his yeah. You know, and he wasn't involved in either of the wars. War no, I no, he never was. For whatever the reason. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, what, he was already 17, and you know, I'm at the turn of the century, so I don't yeah. know if he would have fallen into the draft or. Yeah, so, well, he could have gone to World War One or World War Two. Possibly, yeah, 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 yeah but. Yeah. Uh, yep. But he, for whatever the reasons, he he never had to hmm. and stuff. There's no indication that he ever yeah. offered to join or anything, or because Dixon done. was here in Tucson from '40 to '46. So, right. and if Margargi was in Arizona in Phoenix, I'm sure that they must have at some point. Yeah, it's hard to, to think know, that they didn't. I wouldn't think so. Yeah, meet and greet. <laughs> now, speaking of Dixon, so you knew Edith Hamlin too, right? Right. Yeah, I, I, so I had made a wonderful his third opportunity wife. to meet her. Yeah, tell us about that. That's really well. That was just you know a serendipitous from. You know, with with Ed, as we built our friendship, and uh, of course he was contacted by Donald Haggerty, mm -hmm. you know, who loved Ed's work and you know, right. saw the correlation and influence from Maynard, right, and stuff. So back in, see, that would have been around eighty five, eighty six. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Don said, you know, maybe you, you should try to attempt to do something with, you know, some Maynard Dixon's work and, right. and stuff. He said, I can introduce you to Edith, right. And I said, really? And um, so I said, okay. And so we, we started dealing with uh, getting some imagery, uh, drawings of, of meters and sketches to sell and stuff. And then I thought, well, gee, I should really fly up. And of course she said, yeah. Come and on she up. was in San Francisco. San Francisco. Yeah. And this was when, 86 ish? Yeah, 86 ish. Yeah. yeah, about 86. And uh, so I flew up and she invited me over and she was vivacious. Yeah. And just really a wonderful person to uh, to sit and talk yeah. with and you know of course and she was generous she just you know we sit and had some lunch together and she she said would you like to see some of Maynard's work and I said right. of course yeah and then of course she opened up she said would you like to see some some history of, of Maynard's you know uh, uh, objects and so right. forth and hemophilia so of course she opened up a chest and just started bringing out you know blankets and hats his cane, the cane yeah, right. was just really. <laughs> yeah, a, this is a silver tip cane oh, with the a thunderbolt. Well, it had, it had a dagger, it had yeah, three prong sided yeah, dagger, which, you know, and, and, and I guess people don't realize that he was at the turn of the century living in San Francisco. Yeah. You know, that was a real, you know, tough city to be in. Yeah, well, in 1906, and, he said he learned a lot about human and, you know, uh, behavior watching what happened after the earthquake. Oh, I bet. Oh, yeah, I'm people sure. People were yeah. looting and getting shot and. 
you know, it was the Wild West there for a couple of days. Uh, oh, I bet it was. Yeah, it yeah. was definitely. You would be shot on sight if you caught if you caught looting, and that that was happening. That would, sounds about right. Yeah. Days, <laughs> and sure. so, do you remember any of the paintings that would have been in uh, Edith's house? Uh, like a few uh, things. There wasn't Moonlight much over of, Zion was probably no, there wasn't there. really at that point where she had this little house upon a upon a little hill. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, there wasn't a lot of of Maynard's work. There, the she, oil paintings. Yeah, yeah she, oil paintings. She'd it given most, a lot of those to the kids. At right, that time, I think they had most of it, and she just had a body of work of drawings yeah. and so forth. And I think she was just kind of giving me a, a history of everything, you know, surrounding Maynard. Right. You know, everything from being friends of Ansel Adams, you know, and stuff, and then just the memorabilia of, you know, the clothing and stuff, which were wonderful things. And, and then, of course, she had a portrait she had painted of Maynard. Right. Which was just, you know, a fabulous piece. Uh, yeah, I that's think. in the Oakland Art Museum. Right. And people, I don't just, I don't think they really gave her due. You know, yeah. She was a wonderful painter. Good yeah, painter. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And well, she did the Biltmore Hotel right. mural in 1948, right. nine, uh, 49, I believe, 48, 49. And, uh, you know, so Dixon did the one on the right-hand side of the Biltmore Hotel in 29. You know, we have the Great Depression, and they, the people that were, uh, MacArthur says, hey, we're done. We can't, we can't afford you to do the other side. So right. it gets completely X. So he loses that Great Commission. They open it back up in like 48. And she applies, and she gets it. Oh, that's right. Okay, that's right. Yeah. That's why she's connected to it. Okay. Yep. It wasn't... And it was strictly because of her chops, her artist chops. And so she did kind of an homage to what Maynard would have done as well, uh, you know, and um, using Hopi. And uh, they complement each other beautifully. Right. Exactly. But they were done 20 years apart. Oh, I, oh, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, so. and she got a lot of money for that uh, commission, which really helped her as well because Maynard died in 46. So now she has some extra money coming in and that was right. a big deal. Well, you uh, know, as her. part of when I met her, one of the great things that happened was I had a really good friend in the arts and um, with Don, you know, suggesting these things to start working with her and everything. There was talk of saying, you know, w wouldn't it be nice if we could bring Edith over to Phoenix? Mm -hmm. And... Um, I'm going, really? And I guess they asked her, Don said, and she said, I would love to come. Yeah. So all of a sudden, this arrangement was made, and John Dixon yeah. and Edith came, and one of my friends, and uh, uh, a patron also, said, well, let me throw a party for you. Oh, nice. And so we had this wonderful, What wonderful, year was that? Because that was 19, that would have been 1980s, I think about 86. Yeah. Yeah, that was around 80. I, don't, I wish I could have been more accurate on the date of the, but... She came over to visit, and yeah, she would have been like eighty four then. Yeah, she yeah she was still she was up in age, but she was still real viable. Yeah, and could get around very well, and uh, so uh, she came over, and we had this wonderful you know evening and stuff, and I think that helped cement my relationship a little bit, uh, just that you know she was comfortable, yeah, you know, having artwork for me to sell and so forth, and you know, and we put on one big show, and she loaned me all the items and accoutrements. You know, we had the, the silk portrait. We had the hat, the cane. Right. And I don't know if people really did appreciate it enough. I don't think they picked up on it. I did this in an early period. Yeah, you were a little early. I was a little early, except for one person, of course, our friend Abe Hayes. Yeah. You know, of course, he ate that up. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember any of the pieces? Were there anything in there that was memorable in that first show? You know, there were some show. great drawings uh, there. Uh, the card player one was called. Uh, there was a, a wonderful painting that we were given to try to sell. Uh, uh, um, Choi's Against the Mountain uh, at that time. I think it was one of those about 2632 size. 2024. Was, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I owned it. Oh, okay, no, sorry. Thank you for correcting me. Okay. Yeah, we had that, which was, I thought, a wonderful painting at the time. It was fantastic. And we had it at a very reasonable price. I think we... We only had it priced at about thirty thousand yeah. dollars, I think. Yeah, yeah, that would have been. Yeah, that would be very reasonable back in that, yeah, that time. Yeah, right? sold for a little more than that. Yeah, and we had the drawings anywhere you could buy one of Maynard's drawings. And of course, we really framed them up beautifully. We thought, and right. we had them priced anywhere from as I think the least expensive was about six hundred dollars um, framed, and then upwards of maybe over maybe. I don't think we exceeded three thousand. Yeah. On anything. Yeah. That was 86, but, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that was 87. 80, you know, yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. Um, so we had this wonderful show, and, and we really did have a, a huge response. I think a lot of people were shocked that we had the show. Yeah. I'm and sure. Stuff, and, and especially 
kind of I was a contemporary gallery, right? Knowing Ed and stuff, and of course Don said, "Hey, I'll make this happen. Help you out." Right, and right. Of course, it was just a wonderful, you know, exhibition. And where did you have the show? Did you... That at that time I was in downtown. So it was Staff at your studio, Bishop Lane. Yeah, yeah. At, at, at my first big uh, little gallery that I really had. Yeah, I had a little shop, but then we moved into a yeah. kind of gallery space. And we did it there. And uh, Wouldn't you like to go back and just buy all those drawings oh, up? Oh, I would have kept every single one of them. I, mean, <laughs> I, I did get to keep a couple. In yeah. the end, I, I, I did uh, have, I still have a few left that yeah. are just precious to me. Yeah. And stuff. Uh, yeah, no, they're wonderful. Yeah, they're wonderful. And I, I, I keep saying, that, you know, in the business, I should be a dealer and sell them. But I put them up. Kind of, yeah, know. now take them to the grave. Yeah, then I take them back home. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, John and I actually did a show. I think, I don't know if you went to it or not, but it was at, at the Biltmore, John. Oh, I think I missed the, that one. Yeah, it was I, a I really for, wonderful thing. I don't know what, why or what. I know that they had the great show over at, uh, in Los Angeles. At the, yeah. Well, we had a show that was just, we set up a bunch of paintings. We both came and talked. He talked for an hour. I took Oh, that's right. I do remember that. Yeah, and that. it was in front of the, you know, his... You know, his mother is uh, Edith Hamlin, who was his stepmother. stepmother. And, and then, of course, Maynard's piece. And, you know, so, so Ooh. yeah, well, that was a good one. I'm sure that was wonderful. Oh, it was really wonderful to hear yeah. John just speak. and. Oh, yeah, John was back. great. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I wish I, I didn't even have known him better and stuff. You know, it's just that it was always a long distance kind of, kind of a thing. I actually only got to know him more as you were dealing with him, and I got yeah. to really meet and talk with yeah him and he and stuff. lee were just wonderful human yeah beings. yeah yeah we got really lucky ed and i on a visit to san francisco and he invited us over for dinner and that's when he was in walnut can you know, yeah, walnut creek probably walnut creek mm -hmm. and of course that you know it was just such a treat and that's when he had um i forget the name of the painting um it's got the pueblos in the background uh, grimoire and, or uh the wise men yes yeah, yes wise men. and 1923 of course you know and then during the conversation stuff he says, are, are you familiar with Dorothea Lang? And I said, well, of course. Yeah. He said, would you like to look at some yeah. imagery? He said, okay. <laughs> I said, sure. So he takes me back into a room and just pulls back this curtain, and there's this huge set of print drawers just yeah. full. And he, he says, help yourself. Yeah. Go ahead and just <laughs> you know, so He said, I'll take some stuff out in here. He said, you can just go through and look at all the stuff. So yeah. he was very, very generous and stuff, and it was just I was just overwhelmed. Yeah, it's amazing to meet those kind of people and interact yeah, it, with them. Exactly, it, really, and it was just you know, the time is going by as we're all getting older. Uh -huh. So just, and so now, what are you doing now? What are you working on now? Is there anything that you're doing? That's... You know, nothing specific. You know, I, I, we've always still kept doing the real custom frame making. Right. For, you know, we call ourselves frame makers, not picture framers. Right. I like to think we're you know we're doing a little something more important. Right. You know, we're making frames for collectors, designing frames doing the work for you right doing, you know uh, doing ed's work and uh and then just really trying to uh, i think we have a signature look yeah you I definitely pe do people seem to recognize my frames you know and so and uh we're getting mostly collectors we don't really have walk-in i mean we're on the internet and we're selling some newer type things and right imagery i mean we just had to diversify you know when the economy went we had to just figure out some other ways to you know bring income in and uh Right. So we try to promote the framing, and, and we do that. Um, but it, it, we're, I, I'm still concentrating on lawn, but uh, yeah. uh, it's just, a, I, I would just say right now, it's just a little a little slow, but it's coming back, I guess, you know, like anything. you know. Yeah. So, so. Now you're here to see Dan Butnick, right? Yeah, actually, yeah, we are. We're, we're yeah. actually just getting ready to go over and see him. He is uh, reached that age and point and has had some medical issues. And, yeah. He's, uh, in, and in that's a, a friend so of both of ours. Yes, a good and, friend of both of yeah, ours. Yeah, and he's an interesting guy. I'd love to he's have very him on. Very incredible I mean, photojournalist who's got a history uh, with artists. Yeah, that you is name bar it. none. You yeah. name it. I mean, and not just artists, but also musicians as well. Right. Yeah, yeah that yeah. too. And yeah. uh, he just incredible the amount of people he was in that era of the student art leagues in the 50s yep and just you know he was with the, all those people at the same time frame right you know and uh, i yeah. mean his his association with the abstract, abstract expressionist yeah. his work in the civil rights movement yep. and stuff his just his friendship with george o'keefe right yeah he did he, great photos of george oh, o'keefe yeah, jasper john jasper john has an image of him with uh Right with his first flag, which he could have bought for 
I think maybe oh, a that history that story is hysterical. Bucks. I mean, he yeah. said he he was pulling his hair, and, you know, figuring how to. He said the penny was twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah, there you and go. And he said he 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 told me he was on the phone, beg, borrow, steal. He said he just couldn't come up. <laughs> Which is now in the Metropolitan. Yeah, Museum right. Of Art. And actually, Costello right. bought it. Yeah. And and I guess and I guess it eventually sold for, I guess basically twenty five million. Some at some um, point, some yeah. really astronomical yeah. amount of money. Well, and we, yeah. At, yeah, from twenty five hundred to twenty five million. million. Yeah, I, I have that image in my house. I have yeah. a lot of his. What's well, a wonderful images. image with yeah. Jasper? Oh yes, and so yeah, and he was really great friends. Uh, with with, uh, with um, I'm going blank again. Um, Wilhelm de Kooning. Yeah, yeah uh, no, there's a great one of de Kooning yeah, and uh, and Smith too. Yeah, David Smith. David that Smith. Was really Smith is, he really had a a, a real <laughs> drinking buddy relationship with with uh, yeah. with Smith. I mean, yeah. he. Yeah, they. Uh, I think they fought over women on occasion. <laughs> well, and and so he's got, and some of those are in the um, metropolitan and uh, the modern art. Yes, museum. yes, the museum of modern art. There are imagery of his and stuff that, that are David in Smith's there. Work because there's a, and uh, and those uh, are all early because Smith yeah. died, I think, in '64 in an automobile. Right, accident. another automobile yeah. accident. What are they? these guys are all in automobile? Yeah. yeah. And um, so Dan's, yeah, he's a really interesting individual. He really has a huge he, background yeah, because he traveled so much around the world and, you know, as a photojournalist. And really uh, spent a lot of time in the South, you know, taking all those photographs of Martin movement. Luther yes, King was involved in that. And, right. You know, we filled our home, actually, with those images. And so I wanted I myself. My, yeah, I wanted yeah. my kids to go buy them every day so they would just get to see those images of what was going on. Right. And, and my, even in my middle studio, uh, at, at my gallery, and, or my working studio with framing, you know, we have his, I have a wall of his stuff up. I mean, it's yeah. just, just so wonderful to look at the, the different artists, the civil rights movement. You know, with Martin Luther King and all the people involved in that period, and I mean Dan was in the thick of it. Yeah, you know, I'm, uh, other there are other great, I'm sure, photojournalists of the period, but I think his sensitivity to, you know, the situation and and he was such a stealth yeah, type of person to, and able to photograph these people and and he was able to charm them in in, in a good way. To he became friends with yeah. many of these people. Yeah, of so he was they opened their doors to let him photograph yeah. them. And he does. He did a great photo of Ed Mel as well. Yeah, great, yeah. A wonderful shot. Yeah, I have one myself. Yeah, it was given, and, uh, and yeah. it's a great shot. I think of the essence of Ed, just yeah. being his casual self and being. Yeah, Ed. no. Is, well, uh, he came and shot me one day. He 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 asked if he could do it. And I said absolutely, of course. And we sat around trying. And he had a digital camera that he went around in the gallery, and we probably went for forty five minutes. And yeah. He couldn't get what he wanted. He goes, oh, screw it. And he went and got his little box camera that he used to take all these images of key. Oh, his Leica. Yeah, and oh, yeah. said, let me use this. We sat down, and within two shots, he got it, and I knew he got it. We both right. go, you got it, right? And he goes, yeah, I got it. And so I've used that image on all my book covers for Oh, them. yeah. Well, that's, so it's well, getting that's outdated great. a little now. I look a little older. <laughs> so I wish gonna, you could get him up and move yeah, and get him maybe and re-photograph. Need, have him re-photograph it, but I don't know if I want to <laughs> see the image. So yeah, you got to give uh, yeah you got to give Dan a, a big shout out to yeah to I me. will yeah Dan is just uh, I mean his, his history is just phenomenal and uh, his body of work is just unreal I mean yeah he shot Kennedy in state exactly yeah. I mean he was there just for so many monumental moments I mean his stories of who he met who he ran across right you know uh, I mean really just it goes on and on and he still occasionally. Well, something I don't know what tricks him off to say, oh yeah, I, I was meeting with so and so, or or one day he was telling me, he said how all of a sudden he, um, I said oh yeah, I was with Hemingway, and he said you you were with Hemingway, he said yeah, he said I was in Cuba when it was really dangerous. Oh wow, I and didn't he even said, know that one. <laughs> uh, um, Capa Negro, uh, no no, or, or, no Robert Capa, one of the Capa brothers. Yeah. One brother called him and said, Hemingway's got all these photographs, and the, the SOB won't return them yet. And he says, could you call him up and get him to give him to you to give back to right. me? So Dan said, yeah, I'm here. I'll call him. And so he, so he uh, said that he, when he called him up, he answered the phone and uh, said, yeah, come over for lunch. You know, so he <laughs> said, <laughs> and said he, he actually went over and spent the, spent the day with him. And wow. And it was, uh, I wonder if he uh, took any photos. I wonder if real, he yeah, was he? Yeah, yeah it was yeah. a real eye-opener. I, I, I mean, I think there was a, a side of Hemingway where, 
I know that he was having some issues. Yeah, this wasn't some, probably too long uh, before he Yeah, and I, he killed himself to, uh, not much longer yeah. after that when yeah. he got back. I would think. And Dan said that, yeah, he just saw him, you know, two sides of him. Yeah. And stuff. And uh, I guess at that point, Hemingway's sister was with him. I, I, I don't know. I think so. I think I, there was a relative. I think it was a sister who was actually there with him. Hmm. I think so. She was watching over him. Mm, yeah. You know, he was godlike in Cuba. I mean, he yeah, was, I know. God, he was just, you know. And the, quite the fisherman. Yeah, and, and yeah, that and stuff, but I guess it was time. But, you know, just one of the stories of, of Dan. Just and he worked for, what is Life Magazine? I'm always getting confused. I think or it was Life what? Magazine. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. yeah. And, and he was the one that had, had a huge spread that really set his career a little bit more was when he chose 10 most important painters or abstract expressionist artists in New York who were up and coming. Right. And the 10 he picked, he I, and I always get confused because he said, I went to look. And they are was it life one of the two, and they said, "Nah, we're not interested." And then he guess I guess they were across the street from each other. Right. He said he went over there. They took one look at it, and he they literally went through the ceiling. He said they almost I guess they say stopped the presses. And, right. And they put that in, and he said that every one of those turned out to be the the, the icons yeah. of art. Yeah. No. You know, and no. So, he photographed them all. He photographed them all. And I stuff. know. It's and, just uh, crazy. You know, and his relationships with them, and like I said, with David Smith. Of course, but he really just, you know, his last book he did before, um, on picturing artists really mm -hmm. says a lot about you know. Her, well, and his images about. were recently in uh, New York Times. Right. Well, that. he got a cover of Time Magazine with with. And he got uh, a with, cover with, of with, Time with, Magazine with. with for, exactly with. Um, that was the was that the flag Martin piece? Luther King. Yeah, no, it was Martin Luther King. It was King. the Martin Luther, Luther King. King. I remember and, I had the image. I knew the, that. Right. Said, it's the portrait right after he had given I Dream. The I oh, Dream speech. that's the one. Yeah. Yeah, and it was on the cover, and yeah. actually. I didn't realize he told me the story that um, Time Magazine usually chooses four images and they spread them out for all, all across the world. Yes. And in this one, they chose only his one yeah. image and it was on all the magazine yeah. covers for the whole world. Yeah, because he was at that speech. Yeah, he, he was, was at, right there yeah. and stuff. And uh, yeah, it's a. So that's a guy to know, photograph. guys, Dan Butnick. So yeah. remember that name. He's a. He's a yeah, I hope people will find out who he is more because he. You know, they will. Yeah, I, I you know, I he's think already in major good. museums. Yes, he he's in some great museums and stuff. But so, you know, he's an artist, artist in a sense of the word, where more artists collecting would know him than, you know, collectors yeah. don't. You know, they you, they some people will recognize that. You know, it. You know, well, I should say at first they, but they just sometimes just go. I'm not sure who that is. You know. Yeah, Until they will point it out. Yeah. yeah, they will. Yeah, they're gonna, <laughs> they're gonna wish they bought all that work that he offered. Yeah, I did every time. <laughs> I know you were smart. Every time well, I, he came I got in, all that I, I could bought. afford to get in trade. I, I did bought. a lot of picture framing for him. Yeah, and, uh, I bet. No, but, I. But he was generous. He's, yeah, he's a generous. He was. Person. Is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's a no. generous person. Yeah, I just kept putting him away, putting him away. Yeah. I love the image. You know. Oh yeah, hard not to, to fall in love with it. Yeah. I mean, there. Plus, you got to see the other side of the painting or the art or the sculpture. You got to see the artist. Yeah. And and especially the portraits with George O'Keefe. Yeah. They which were much more of a personal. You know, they weren't like they're an artist, up, you know, yeah. famous artist coming to have them pose. Right. His whole thing was to be in the most natural settings. Yes. I think the most intimate settings. Yes, I agree. Yeah, you know, and the, and that's what I think you saw with George O'Keefe. Yeah, they're and beautiful. Stuff. And he's still digging out images that he, of course, every artist looks at. You know, that's not very good. 25, 30 years later going, well, this is not as bad as I <laughs> thought, you know. And who's <laughs> also guilty of that is Ed. Yeah. Ed. Ed you know. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I've looked at some things. Which is to that, our advantages sometimes. Yeah, I've, I've seen, acquired some work that. Yeah, he says, you this like that? He's like, oh, you, I'll well, make a deal of that. I'm going, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think he doesn't do that anymore. No, he's not doing that. <laughs> he's figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've both known him for so many years. It's been a, that's, I think that's our common bond, which yes, is, is, yeah. a, is a great one. But well, he's another sweet, generous, you know, uh, man. Uh, yeah, I know. He's wonderful. I can't speak well enough of him. Yeah, I. <laughs> I, I agree. He's easy to live with. You yes. Know? Oh, he is. In my yeah. Head. I just, in fact, Nothing. there's one behind your head. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't even realize it, but oh. I didn't do that. It just is, there happens to be an Ed Mel behind your head. <sighs> well, good, because I'm looking at so many And your pictures. frame, too. That's yeah, well, funny. Good. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. So, well, Michael Collier, thank you so much oh, for coming. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's spending. a pleasure. This is yeah. so much fun. I, I, yeah. I, 
you know, it is just a, a casual thing that you can really speak comfortably. Yeah, yeah, and I learned a lot. That's the thing, you know, this is every time I want to come away with some nugget of information that I didn't know about. And man, I came away with a lot today. So thank you so okay, much. Well, thank you. Oh, yeah, All wonderful. Right, go say hi to yeah, Mr. Butnick. And I'll tell Dan, him, I think he'll yeah. be thrilled that I saw you and, and that we did this. Yeah, I want to get him down here. Yeah, I hope so. I wish I could say you could. I, well, I'm taking him a power wheelchair. Yeah, we'll figure it out. We're going to get him out of bed. If he can yeah. get then we'll get him I, over I here. I think that's what he needs. The world he, needs to hear Dan. He's, he's got some interesting stories. Yeah, he has too many good stories. to, And he is a wonderful storyteller. He is a wonderful storyteller. Yeah. I agree. And you got to get, get prepared and then yeah. sit back because he will. I'll have to you. make it a part one, part two. Yeah, yeah maybe you have to have a part three for him. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay, very good, Thank Michael. you again. Thank you. The Art Dealer Diaries are brought to you by Medicine Man Gallery, located for over 26 years in Tucson, Arizona, specializing in antique Native American art, early Western art, including the famed Maynard Dixon, as well as modern art. You can find everything online at medicinemangallery.com. There's over 6,000 objects to select from. Also, the Charles Bloom Murder Mystery Series, written by yours truly, me, Mark Sublett. There's six books in the series, and they follow the protagonist Charles Bloom through all the intrigue of the art world set in Santa Fe and the Navajo Nation. These can be found on Audible, eBooks, Amazon, and of course, the gallery at medicinemangallery.com.